Um, Dr. Hozak, I appreciate the fact that you've indicated that tough choices have to be made. Uh, this chart uh, focuses on the tough choices that were made uh, when the blue line was created. In 1993, we passed a budget making the tough choices that was uh, severely criticized, in fact, criticized so, so effectively that uh, Democrats lost their majority in the next election. Um, we, um, in 1995, when the new majority took over, they passed budgets that were uh, viewed by, the, uh, by President Clinton as irresponsible, and he vetoed all of them. In fact, um, the government was closed down because he refused to sign the uh, Republican budgets. If you want to know what would happen if he had signed them, we do know because they passed them again in 2001, where you begin the last red line, and you can see um, uh, exactly what happened. Uh, in 2001, at the end of the Clinton uh, administration, we had a projected surplus of $5.5 trillion. That was converted, as you know, to, ad to additional debt of approximately um, uh, $3.5 trillion or more. Uh, had we not messed up the budget in 2001, we would have paid off the national debt two years ago, debt held by the public. Um, now we find ourselves in a huge deficit. One of our first priorities, obviously, is in uh, creating jobs. Now, we're in the ditch with the deficit. My qu first question is, if we cut spending, uh, it, affecting the deficit, you can either cut spending or, or increase taxes. If we cut spending, what effect would that have on jobs? Right now? Right now. Right now, either uh, in 2010, when, when we face a big gap between how much the economy could produce and how much it is producing, Either raising taxes or reducing spending today would be harmful to jobs because the key impediment to job growth right now is boosting demand for how much firms could produce. That situation changes over time, but for 2010, that's the answer. And so if we were to do anything credible about the deficit this year, it would have an adverse effect on It would employment. be counterproductive, yes. Okay. And, and another that's not to deny that we, don't, we need to get the deficit down over time, but this year it would be counterproductive. In terms of dealing credibly with jobs, one of the challenges we have is as we create jobs on the federal level, states are laying people off. The Recovery Act provided $140 billion for, um, uh, for states, and yet they still cut their budgets an additional $300 billion, for a total of um, uh, 400, almost $450 billion. That just went to offset what the states were doing. Um, is it accurate that, um, is that accurate? We've essentially offset what the damage the states were doing to the uh, economy? Uh, we have, through direct state fiscal relief and through uh, federal actions, offset, uh, I, I'll get the exact uh, calculations, but offset the drag that state and local governments typically exert on, uh, on a recession because they're doing counterproductive steps. So, so one of the challenges we have is just to keep up to zero, to get up to the point where we are offsetting what the states are laying off. When we create a job, state lays off a job, we haven't made any progress. So the first almost $450 billion. Again, without commenting on the exact figures, because there's, I think, some ambiguity, one of the reasons why state fiscal relief was provided through the Recovery Act in a variety of ways was to offset the actions that states would have to take to lay off workers, to lay off nurses and teachers and, and cops and so on and so forth, which would exacerbate the downturn. Uh, could we get the next chart, please? Uh, this is when we had um, a good fiscal responsibility during the Clinton administration, we created an average of 237 million, 237,000 jobs a month uh, during the Bush administration, would, although we were overspending the budget about $8 trillion over 10 years, we, we did worse. Uh, the long-term fiscal challenges we have, the next chart, uh, this chart shows the change in percentage of GDP of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, net interest, and all of other spending. And if you look closely, the only thing that's really growing is Medicare. So if you wanted to solve the problems, seems like getting rid of Medicare would be one way to do it, if that's the it. tough choice that, uh, that you would make. Can you talk about the effect, how much, um, I understand you said 75, you'd have to cut Medicare 75 percent. 
Can you um, explain what impact that would have on a person who is trying to get health care with a Medicare voucher that's only 25 percent of the cost of health care and what it would do to employees if you eliminated the tax preference for health care, if you eliminated that and had people essentially going out on the market as individuals rather than the market, what um, the tough choices would amount to in, um, in the health care choices that well, the Republican alternative would envision? And I think uh, with regard to the 75 percent, you're, you're uh, referring to the reduction that would occur in Medicare and Medicaid spending under Mr. Ryan's, uh, the Republican alternative. Look, the fact of the matter is, uh, I think there, again, I'm going to give him credit, too, for stepping forward with the proposal, but there is a significant question about whether that is even a feasible uh, approach because you would be providing individuals with a voucher that would not pay for the cost of health care over time, an increasingly small share of the cost of health care over time. They would uh, not have the type of benefit that would be provided through Medicare where uh, there's less uncertainty about the cost that they face. So they'd face not only more definite money out of their pocket, but a lot more uncertainty about how much they'd have to pay. And they'd be struggling with many of the same problems that individuals in the current individual market struggle with, which, uh, invol which uh, are unfortunate. So in that situation, I wonder whether future Congresses would actually stick to a voucher level that was inadequate for the nation's elderly to purchase their own health insurance. In w and if, you, if a future Congress didn't, not only would you have trans uh, dramatically changed the Medicare program, you wouldn't even get the budget savings that Mr. Ryan is aiming for. The point of which is, I think what we need to do with regard to Medicare and Medicaid is get at those underlying drivers, provide much better information about what works and what doesn't, change incentives for providers so that they have incentives to provide quality, not quantity, improve incentives for prevention and wellness, and so on and so forth. You can go down the list. That is a different structure and a different approach, but I'd say, frankly, without all of those components present anyway, I'm not sure Mr. Ryan's approach would even work.